the atrocities that I've personally witnessed in my team has been involved in is something that most people can't wrap their brains around because it's just pure evil, but it exists just because you don't think it does and you're not physically seeing it, you can ignore it, but it's there. Um, I was like you, I didn't, I, I heard about it, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's not here in my bubble, in my town, until I started going out and being in the field and being in operations and seeking this out. And when you see this, it literally changes who you are. So the borders are open. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Restitch America. And today is going to be the second installment of our interview series. And I'm very excited about the guests I'm uh, bringing here today. And I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction um, on our guest today. Her name is Christy Hutcherson. And Christy, um, Christy is the founder of Women Fighting for America, WFFA. Christy is dedicated to defend America from its founding roots. She has been fighting on the border for over two years, bringing truth around national security or bringing the truth around the national security threat while exposing the activity of the cartels. She has been protecting the lives of those being trafficked and bringing awareness to the fentanyl crisis. Christy is dedicated to being a voice of truth for the American people to save the soul of our nation. And so I'm going to welcome here Christy Hutcherson to our interview box. Hi, Christy. Hi, thank you for having me on. I'm excited about this interview. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, coming on with us. So this issue that you're fighting on is something that is dear to my heart. So I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm an immigrant <laughs> to the United States. And it took me about 18 years to finally get through the entire process of becoming an American citizen. So I became a citizen in 2021. And so one of the things that have always um, been of interest to me is our immigration system. And so um, I know that this is something that you are following and fighting on and so on. So I wanna give you a couple of minutes to, before we get into the nitty gritty of what you do, just first tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you into this line of work. Well, first, welcome to America. I know it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of money um, and perseverance and patience to become an actual legal uh, citizen of the United States of America. And I think we are all immigrants. Um, my family immigrated here as well. I'm a Russian Jew on my, my mother's side. My family fled Stalin. And so I welcome immigrants from all over the world. Um, we are the melting pot. America is. But there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do something. And the reason why we have a right way in place, it's not only just to protect the sovereignty of a nation, but it's also to protect those individuals who are wanting to come here for a better way of life or for to escape persecution or whatever the reason is mm -hmm. to, to start a new life in a new country like America. So that, I, I really wanted to say that first and foremost. Um, what got me on this path, a little bit of personal about myself. Um, first and foremost, I am a Christian. Uh, I gave my life to Jesus Christ um, at the tender age of 24 years of age. Um, just like many Christians, you know, you're, I, I think that you get that euphoria, you know, because when you meet your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, there's this incredible um, energy that surrounds those first few days, right? And months mm -hmm. and years. Um, but then like everything, life gets in the way. And as Christians, we start um, falling away from really the power that and the authority that we have within ourselves, right? And that is the strength through Jesus Christ. And so I was one of those individuals. Um, how I got started on this journey, um, I've, I've been doing this a little over three years now. And quite frankly, I was met with an audible in the backyard doing a Bible study on Good Friday. Um, there was a lot of things going on. Uh, behind the scenes that had been stirring in my heart prior to this conversation that God had with me. And 
He said, Christy, I called you in 93, you denied me. I called you in 2012, you denied me a second time. Are you gonna deny me a third? And I'm not, uh, a, I'm not a crier, nothing that there's nothing wrong with that because I think emotions are very important. It's just, uh, it's not in my DNA. I'm a pretty tough cookie. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Russian Jew, like I said, and I'm also American Indian Cherokee on my father's side. So I'm a little tough. And, but when the Holy Spirit literally grits a hold of your heart, and speaks to you, God speaks to you, and you hear that, it changes you. And I said, you know what, God, I'm not equipped, I'm not qualified, I'm a nobody, but I'm not gonna run from you anymore. Whatever that looks like, I'm, I'm all in this time. And I'm sorry it took me, you know, all of the years in between uh, that it took to for me to say yes and be all in. And you know, God said something to me all month that day. He said, Christy, I'm calling the nobodies because the somebodies haven't been doing their job. And that was very powerful. And I haven't looked back since. Um, I'm probably going to write a book about this because I'm the perfect example of somebody who is nobody, but God uses that individual for his purpose and opens up incredible doors and has an incredible journey plan for each and every one of us to get into this battle that we're in uh, to save the heart and soul, not only of America, but of our nation and the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. So we have a couple of things in, co in common. So I came to America for the first time in 2003 as a Christian missionary. Think about that. And so I came here um, and, and went door to door, you know, teaching the gospel to people. And I spent two years doing that in Los Angeles. It was a very rewarding experience. It changed my life completely. So uh, I am in the same boat as you as being called to go and do the work of God. And I was only 19 at the time. And so the same kind of thing, I felt like, what do I know, right? You know, I am the nobody who gets called to go and, and preach the gospel. And so we're kind of in the same boat on that um, spectrum. So I, I really love the fact that um, you finally said that you heeded the call and decided to kind of you know put your heart and soul into what you're doing today, which is really, really important. So we gave a brief introduction of you. I, I read that little spiel um, about what you do and what inspired you to start this particular work at the border and uh, what, what was the catalyst that brought you into that particular line of work? Sure. So when I first started out and, you know, like I said, um, answering the call to God, um, you know, there's a lot of things that got, went on the first year that I got into this movement. First and foremost, Women Fighting for America is birthed out of numerous conversations I had with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He actually gave me and downloaded the name Women Fighting for America. Um, and I actually had some, you know, some people on my own team going, that's just too aggressive fighting, you know. And I'm like, well, you know what? We forget that our God He's not a meek and mild God. He actually can be very fierce, right? He's taken down civilizations. Um, you know, we're in a time and a season of battle. We are in a war. The war is for ultimately the domination of earth, right? There's a heavenly realm and there's a battle going on with the archangel Michael and the dragon and those who are fallen. And so this was birthed out of a conversation with God. Um, I went on a Heal Our Land um, bus tour. Um, it was about healing our land. This was coming. We were still in the height of COVID. It was a presidential election season. And God wanted me to go to 15 plus states. I went to 67 cities. I spoke in churches. Um, everything God said was going to happen, 100% happened. And it was supernatural. And fast forward um, two weeks into the Biden presidency. I got a phone call from a friend of mine and she said, Christy, I have friends who live in Yuma, Arizona. They're literally afraid to leave their homes. Um, and she started telling me some of the things that they were afraid of. And she said, will you please go as women fighting for America and go see what's going on down there? And before I do anything, I always pray, God, is this where you want my time talents to be utilized? And he said, Christy, not only do I want you to go to the Yuma, Arizona, I want you to go and I want you to take a small elite team and I want you to go into Mexico and I want you to start driving the full 2000 plus miles of our Southern border. And I don't want you to stop. I want you to see what is going on and taking place at our borders, both Southern, Northern and following how 
the destabilization of America and ultimately uh, the world is happening and going to be happening through the lens of open borders and policies. And I want to be very clear on something. What I do, even though a lot of people will say it's political, it absolutely is not political. Political, it doesn't matter who sits in the White House. Do you understand? It doesn't matter if you have an RD or an I behind your name, Republican, Democrat, Independent, does not matter. What matters who sits at the highest levels of any government is the policies, the agenda, and are they founded in the Judeo-Christian principles and the constitution that made this country so great? That is truly the only thing that matters and everything else needs to be stripped away and we need to have a mind shift on this. And so that's what I was talking about and educating about. So the same thing with the borders, it has to do with policy, it has to do with agendas. And therefore I have spent the last two plus years of my life with my team, because I cannot do it without my team, looking at how the policies are purposefully orchestrated to destabilize America and ultimately the world. And during this process, you also learn about the humanitarian crisis and the, and the atrocities that are purposely being perpetrated on the innocent. And that is something that I cannot and will not turn my back on. Wow. <laughs> that is that is powerful. And I think a lot of times, a lot of us are removed from the border. And so you hear bits and pieces. Usually, for instance, we heard about the truck with 50 migrants that um, end up, you know, dying in the back of a truck. And, and you hear bits and pieces of these kinds of news. But a lot of people are not living and breathing what is going on at the border. And so especially I would say those who are far removed the people in Martha's Vineyard and so on, right? And so what would you say have been some of the most shocking discoveries that you've made at the border since you started this project? Well, first and foremost, what takes place at the border literally happens throughout the United States of America. Okay. Uh, the cartels, these trans criminal organizations do not stay at the border. They have operations and businesses set up throughout, not just uh, America, throughout the United States and every state, literally every state has a criminal organization that is ran or, or legitimate business that is owned and operated by these trans criminal organizations, AKA cartels, right? And so you are living in a fantasy if you think that your community and your neighborhood is not affected by this. Look at the drug overdoses in your community. You can look at the statistics yourself. Start looking at what in areas are human trafficked, right? The trafficking, the sex trafficking, the labor trafficking. You can find these statistics out on your local law enforcement web pages. So you just are living in a bubble. You're choosing to put a blind eye to this. Um, you know, we had 117,000 overdoses last year. Out of that 117,000, 77,000 were from fentanyl. Where do you think fentanyl comes from? Fentanyl comes from our enemy, China. China purposefully is giving the synthetics and the, and the ingredients that is, by the way, illegal to even transport into Mexico. So just that alone, that's an illegal activity from a government who has intent and ill harm for the American people. This is a purposeful act to work with the cartel to bring in those synthetics to kill the off our young military age men and women, right? And, and to kill off the youth and to change the dynamics of America. So this is an act of war, make no mistake. So you are not um, immune to it because you live in rural Indiana. Um, so that's important to, to know. Okay. Um, the cartels have a stronghold everywhere, and not just in America, but throughout the free Western world and other countries. And cartels can be um, highly sophisticated organizations. These people went to Wharton School of Business, Harvard, Yale. Uh, yes, they have thug arms to do their dirty work, just like anything else. They have mercenaries, right? Those are where you see the really dirty stuff that I've been seeing at the border decapitated heads, people being shot, gutted, killed, um, babies being decapitated, their bodies thrown into the Rio Grande, 
um, you name it, in these stash houses, tunnels that I've been onto, the rape trees I've been to, the Mexican highway, we call the Mexican highway, uh, the rough terrain where the mules, the coyotes or the wildcats, they bring up the women and the children. They come to these staging grounds. In these staging grounds, you've got what we call rape trees. Um, this is where they violently tie them down and violently gang rape them and into submission. And if they fight back, sometimes their heads are bashed in with in their skulls and they're left there to die uh, before the uh, mules pick them up and take them on their transport to whoever bought them, right? So the atrocities that I've personally witnessed and my team has been involved in is something that most people can't wrap their brains around because it's just pure evil, but it exists just because you don't think it does and you're not physically seeing it, you can ignore it, but it's there. Um, I was like you. I didn't, I, I heard about it, but it's like, yeah, it, it's not here in my bubble, in my town, until I started going out and being in the field and being in operations and seeking this out. And when you see this, it literally changes who you are. So the borders are open. We have the cartels and these criminal organizations have full operational control of our borders. Um, not to mention the terrorists, the pedophiles, the murders, the rapists, the, the worst of the worst uh, coming over our border into America, living, breathing in your communities right now because of the policies of this administration. Wow, this is quite sobering. Now, I understand the whole thing with the fentanyl, but I didn't realize how kind of interconnected and completely organized these um, cartels are and, and how they're basically able to operate within every community in America. I think that's that's a revelation that I think a lot of people um, just simply refuse to accept. And so when you hear, you know, the the um, Mayorkas, the DHS uh, secretary tell us that the border is secure and we have operational control, what you are saying is um, the evidence belies what he's saying, right? It's not just myself. Finally, you have congressmen, um, law enforcement officers who work the ground every single day. You have U.S. Marshals and Border Patrol agents who are willing to go off camera to tell you the truth, right? This is a narrative that's being perpetrated, the lie to the American people by New Yorkers, aka from the top down, right? This is an order given from the highest levels of our government. That is the president of the United States, who in my um, belief, has murder and blood on his hands and his whole administration. And my understanding of our own constitution, these are treasonous acts. Uh, the president of the United States of America, his number one duty, number one duty is to, to protect and defend a sovereign nation and the constitution. He is purposefully not doing that. He is breaking and ordering people to break the laws that are already on the books. And we don't have enough people with backbone in Congress or in the Senate to hold this administration accountable for the acts against the government of the United States, aka we the people. Mm -hmm. And we have national security crisis on our hands. Immigration falls under federal government. However, national security falls under everybody, including the states, individual states. Individual states have a constitution. And when the federal government is allowing terrorists to come, literally terrorists, to come over our borders, this is not my word. This is from law enforcement officers. We've already caught over 94 mm -hmm. plus terrorists. We already know that there's over 2,000 plus getaways a day that are terrorists. I have film and footage. Me and my team have film and footage of terrorists, cartels bringing terrorists into our country with armed full autos into our nation. The, we know this is going on. Where is our federal government? Where are our Congress? Where are the Senate to say, you know what? This is enough to impeach this president and get him out of office and also hold him up on charges against the United States of America. I would like to know where they are. But the states right now can do something about this. They can actually put the full force of the National Guard and every single law enforcement officer at the border to stop this invasion into our country. And they don't have the backbone. These are Band-Aids, the wall's great, put them up. Enact the National Guard, great. But if you're enacting the National Guard and you're not giving them an actual clear directive to gather up all of these individuals who are flooding our nation, 
putting them into a facility where they cannot just freely roam the United States of America and then vet them and then uh, weed them out who is safe, who is not safe under our laws that are already on the books. This is what's going on, folks, every single day. So our borders are not secure and they are wide open for anybody, including okay. terrorist nations. So one of the challenges I think that happens is and this is something that is pervasive throughout America, is this idea or, or this kind of trend where we box ourselves in because we have tied certain narratives together. So for instance, um, when you talk to the average person on the left, they would say, you know, any opposition to, you know, the border and, and what is happening at the border stems out of some kind of xenophobia or some kind of racism. And so you get, you know, people who are completely um, paralyzed from doing anything because th that narrative has been accepted by the media and it makes it impossible to truly talk about some of the things you're talking about and the experiences that we're having. The fact that we're losing 100,000 people every year to this drug invasion. And, and a lot of people are talking about them as not overdoses. These are poisonings, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of these people don't know what they're taking and, and they're caught completely off guard and just one you know, a couple of grams of this thing can kill an adult human. And so how do we decouple this conversation from this whole idea of kind of, you know, xenophobia or racism or how can we do that so that the average American can kind of turn their, their thinking about this to say, this is no longer some issue about, you know, you know, getting too many you know, low wage workers or an issue around, you know, oh, we don't like, you know, brown people or or that kind of thing that you hear in the media all the time. How do we turn that conversation? Is it, um, and, and in this case, I'm going to refer to, I know you're working on a documentary, is it potentially showing them what is truly happening in a way that they can't ignore anymore? Well, those labels, because those are labels, right? We we want to label people xeno, xenophobic, um, you're a racist, you're a bigot, all of these things. Um, I'm a I'm a studier of history. And again, my family fled Stalin. So you know, I've been called a white supremacist, but the left didn't get that narrative that I was actually my family were Jewish and they were marched off to the gulags and some of them didn't make it. My family literally left everything in Russia. Uh, to to flee here for a better way of life to save their actual physical lives, right? And so the the tactic of the communist regimes, right, or the left, the, the communist Mao. So if you study Mao, you study Stalin, you study Hitler, um, all of these, uh, the Chinese malignment, you, you start reading and understanding what your history is. That's one of the things that um, was so greatly used, especially let's talk about Nazi Germany. Um, with the Jews, the propaganda machine, which is you control the narrative, you control the media, you can brainwash and control a lot of the outcomes. That's just part of the political correctness, which started at the late 80s, beginning of the early 90s, was part of that machine to start keeping you silent, to keep the church, quite frankly, silent, because they're afraid of the church. Um, because when the church falls, everything else falls along with it. And so morals and all of those things. Um, I don't care what people call me, quite frankly. We need to get backbones in this country and in this world, quite frankly. Um, you can call me anything you want. And like I said, I've been called everything from a white supremacist to a racist to a bigot to everything else. Doesn't matter to me. I don't really care. You don't know me. Um, my 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 actions, my words, my speak highly of what I do in the field. I have friends from all walks of life. We were all created in one image, and that is the image of God. Doesn't matter the color of the skin. What, that's the division, right? That's that's the devil. The devil wants to keep us divided because in unification, we're stronger. Um, that's what the left is afraid of. That's what the communists are afraid of. They are afraid if we put down all of those barriers and we come together with one voice, um, then we're going to be the powerful movement that they cannot stop. So get rid of all of those preconceived notions, everybody out there and start voicing and standing up and pushing back. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? That's the first question to ask yourself. I looked at myself very long in the mirror and I had to ask myself that question. And so I'm very secure with who I am in Jesus Christ. I'm secure with who I am. And I know I'm none of those things, right? 
Um, so therefore I don't allow them to control my mind and my thoughts because I know who I am. And those are lies of the devil. So let's first attack that and get that out of your head, because now you can do the work that God's called us to do. And bigot, racist, immigration, I would challenge any of these individuals who are calling all of this stuff that we're xenophobe, all of these things, immigrant, we don't like the color of their skin, to come down to the border with me. I've asked them before. They don't come because they they know that what they're going to see goes against everything, the lies that they're perpetrating off their lips to everybody else around them. And I want you to think about this. Chuck Schumer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down. You want to know who the real bigot and the racists are? They, they are right in front of your face. They're the ones who are screaming the loudest and calling us what we are. Chuck Schumer had the audacity to get up on the steps in the Capitol and say, we need to have immigration. And I want you to really think about what he said. We need to have immigration because first and foremost, we're not reproducing enough, the white people. Two, we need to have lower income workers aka labor slavery. The party of slaves was the Democratic Party, who I know most of you don't understand that and realize that because they've watered down history and lied to you. But you have a brain that God gave you and you need to start thinking for yourselves. The party of the KKK is the Democratic Party. The party of the slaves is the Democratic Party. Those who freed the slaves was the party of the Republicans. This is fact not fiction. So when you start understanding the narrative of what they push, they are always the opposite of who they truly are. Why would Chuck Schumer say that we need to breed basically the brown people for what? To be slaves, for our labor camps, for our agriculture, to produce our food for us, plantation owners. That's what that was reminiscent of. Think about what Chuck Schumer said. It is disgusting, it is vile, but that is their plan. The World Economic Forum said it best, and these are all part of the World Economic Forum leaders. You will have nothing and you will like it. There will be the haves and the have nots. Mm -hmm. There will be the slave owners and there will be the plantation owners. Exactly. And that's what we're fighting against. That's what women fighting for America. Is fighting against. I remember, th thank you for that. I remember over, um, I think a couple of months ago when um, governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, sent some immigrants over to Martha's Vineyard, Nancy Pelosi basically said exactly what you're saying uh, Chuck Schumer said, which is, you know, don't we need these people to pick fruit, right? So basically this idea of relegating people and their potential to, we need them to come and pick our fruits is exactly um, the the kind of racism I think that a lot of people don't talk about, right? Because when I came to America, I didn't come here because I wanted to to relegate myself to the, what I would call the jobs Americans don't want to do. I came here because I wanted to reach my full potential. So why do politicians like that relegate people? to these menial jobs that they think are beneath regular Americans, right? So exactly what you're saying, I agree with it, with the, the fact that they're looking at these people definitely as, you know, economic slaves, basically. You know, they might not be in chains, but they will never have, I mean, if that is their plan for them, they will never have, you know, the financial, fiscal wherewithal to be able to thrive and live the American dream. Right. And and it's a shame right. that they're putting these kind of um, limitations on people, a group of people, a class of people who are coming to the country. So a lot of times when you hear people calling others these kinds of names, racism, you know, racist, xenophobes and so on, when you actually evaluate their own policies and their own ideologies, you find that they are the ones who actually perpetuate that. And it's basically projection that is, is happening, the, exactly the things they're doing, they blame on the other side, right? And I see a lot of that going on. 
hundred percent. And, you know, if you look at um, even the president of the United States, who's sitting in that White House right now, he's a huge bigot. If you go back and listen from, first of all, he's been in politics for over 40 years, right? So go back and listen to some of the stuff and the policies that he has. He is a racist. He's a quintessential racist. And so, you know, they want to deflect on us because they don't want people to look over here. Um, you know, those individuals who are coming over here um, through the southern border, and by the way, it's over 174 plus different nations. It's not just Cuba and Venezuela and Nicaragua and Haiti and the Dominican and um, all of these Mexico and Central America, et cetera. But let's let's hone in on, on those that they're talking about. Um, what do you think the welfare system is? It was created by the Democratic Party. The welfare system and all of these individuals who are coming into our nation, they don't speak our language. They're not as educated. They come from very poor countries. Um, when they are absorbed into our system, they're given um, everything under the sun, freebies, right, from our own personal welfare system. It is, a, it is purposefully uh, set up that way to keep them in the welfare system. What do you, that's what it, it is. And if you look at every poverty city, democratic city, right? Inner cities where there's massive poverty, where people can't get out of this cycle that they're in, nine times out of 10, it's a huge welfare state. They are kept under who, big daddy, who government, which is um, policies that are perpetrated by the, mostly the democratic party. Um, you know, these individuals, they need a hand up not a hand out. We can take these individuals from all of these different countries and nations. And I've looked at this very closely because again, I, I'm down at the border. I'm in the trenches with these people. I'm rescuing them. I'm saving them. And I'm listening to them. We need to go and help them where they are in their countries. If you really want to help make these other countries more prosperous, you take our knowledge, our skills, and we go to their country and we set up massive um, camps where we can educate them and train them on agriculture and politics and all of these amazing things, education, and help them and show them how to be productive members of their own country, their own society, so they can take back what the government has stolen from them in a lot of these third world countries and communist nations to break the chains, right, of tyranny and they can be self-sufficient, and then they can be leaders in their own country. That's what needs to happen. Um, but they don't want that because they want to keep them oppressed. Are you suggesting that um, vice, the vice president's trip to South America to determine the root causes did not achieve its intended purpose? A hundred percent not. Yeah, that's that's that was always dubious from the beginning. A anyway, so... What has been, over the, your two-year journey so far, what has been the biggest challenge you have faced in getting the word out to fellow Americans? You know, um, the, the secular media does not want to report, and it doesn't matter. It's from, you know, Fox News all the way up. They do a great, Fox is probably doing the best job, but it's still a narrative, and it's not a full narrative. Uh, so secular media does not want the American people or the world to understand truly the impact of open border policies and how it's impacting and destabilizing America. And it's going to make America fall within very soon, by the way. Um, there, there's a lot of information that I, on another time, I'd like to get out there. We have tunnels, we have uh, terrorists, we have stuff flowing in and out of our country. So that has probably been the biggest challenge uh, for myself and my team. The other thing is, you know, quite frankly, you know, we are doing the role that our government won't do. And we're willing to be on the front lines. Our work is extremely dangerous. Uh, we've been shot at. I have bounties on my head. I have full-time security, next level security, um, almost around the clock to protect me because of what we're uncovering and the information we're actually putting out there. It is dangerous to this government. It is dangerous um, from a from an information standpoint, and they don't want that out there. So the biggest challenge for us is getting people to understand the truth, getting that voice out there, and then also funding. Um, I fund almost all of this myself. 
And it, it costs a lot of money to do operations at the border. It costs a lot of money to rescue women and children from the bondage of slavery and, and the sex trade and labor trade, and quite frankly, the organ harvesting industry. Um, so those are the two biggest challenges we've faced is really getting private funding uh, for our operations and then also getting the uh, media to to pick up some of these videos. Some of my videos have gone over 1.5 million hits um, and it's because it's organic, which I love by the way, but we have to get the word out there and make people understand that we're all in this together. What happens at the border affects your community and you need to get into this battle to fight for the heart and soul of our nation and to save lives, quite frankly. Isn't a child's life worth a dollar? You know, we ask for a dollar a day to save a child's life. It costs about ten to $30,000 a week to operate, uh, to go in, to do these uh, very serious, very dangerous operations. Uh, we've got people who have very, very special skill sets, and it takes very special equipment to do what we do. Um, but your money goes to an incredible cost. And we don't even take salaries. I haven't had a salary in three years. When I stepped down as CEO of my company, I walked away from everything. We're volunteers because we love this nation. We love our country. And quite frankly, when you see the atrocities that I've seen, you don't want to have one more child's life or one more woman raped, killed, murdered, or sold. Wow. that That's very powerful. Um, about 10 years ago, um, I established an organization I called Legal Immigrants for the Restoration of America. I think a lot of um, times, um, as immigrants, a lot of times we we keep a low profile. We came here for a reason. A lot of us are still you know, helping our family members back home and so on and so forth. But I've always felt that the America we came here for is being taken from us. And we need to work hard to restore the America that brought us here, right? And I think that's really important. And so I know that, you know, yes, we can we can talk to American citizens and bring that awareness, but I also want to empower legal immigrants because they can't look at me and say, well, you don't want other people to come here because you're racist, right? I am here. I came here for that opportunity. And so I'm, I'm, I would love to be at the forefront of some of this conversation so that we take away that narrative from, from the media. We take away this idea that it's it's out of xenophobia or out of you know hate for people who don't look like us and go out and show people these are the things that are happening. And those of us who understand truly the vulnerable nature of people's lives in third world countries and, and places that are politically um, destabilized, we understand those, those conditions. However, we also understand that, like you said, there's a right way to do things. And one of the reasons I came to America was because of the rule of law, right? A place where I could count on the laws that were on the books and to a place where I, I could expect that the laws would be enforced fairly, right? And, and so, I am grateful for the work you're doing. I think um, bringing attention to to this crisis is very important, and I'm really glad you came over to to share this with us because I think this is an eye opener for everybody. And as I said before, you are creating a documentary, so I would like you to share a little bit about what's coming and what we can expect over the next um, couple of months from you. Well, I partnered with His Glory. Uh, Pastor Dave uh, Scarlett had approached me and asked me um, if I would do a documentary in collaboration with him um, on the border. And I said, absolutely. And so we, we've been down to the border. We're actually getting ready to go back to the border to finish up the filming. And the documentary is going to show America what they're not being seen. We go, when I tell you we go into places not even law enforcement go to, um, that's not an understatement. And so you're going to get to see the underbelly of open borders, the ugly side of open borders and how it impacts your life, no matter where you live in this country. Um, we all are in this together. And this documentary hopefully will show how much it actually impacts your day-to-day -day life and your children and your children's lives. You know, I'm a mom and 
I couldn't imagine and the my child being subjected to the things that are um, going on at the border. And when I close my eyes and I rescue a child, I see my son's faces. And that's what I'm asking your listeners to do, to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine, even though you're not seeing them every day in your community, but a child being kidnapped at the border in these caravans, or a child in your community being kidnapped and earmarked for the sex trade industry by these cartels or the labor trade industry. I want you to imagine that your son or your daughter or your grandchild, would you sit by and do nothing? I know I wouldn't. As a mom, I would fight like hell to get my son or daughter back. That's what your dollar a day does when you partner with Women Fighting for America. That's what this documentary is gonna show you. Help fund the fight. Help fund saving your child's life. Because we're all parents. All the children belong to all of us. Isn't that what God has entrusted us with? He said, do, do something to the least of these and woe to you. When you sit by and you do nothing and you stay silent and you don't put your time, your talents and your treasures into saving these little ones who are being raped and murdered or sold into the slave industry or the sex slave industry, you are doing just that. You're complicit. So we all need to get in this fight. Open borders matter, not just from a national security perspective, but from a humanitarian perspective. We need to shut our borders down. We need to protect the innocent. And that's just what Women Fighting for America is doing on the front lines every day. Thank you so much for, for your hard work. Um, I, I think in America, we focus so much on our past. And we talk about slavery as something that happened to us and has repercussions all the way till today. And unfortunately, we focus on that past to the detriment of what is happening right under our noses right now, because the slave trade is real. It's happening right now. And as you said, this is, we need to bring attention to it because a hundred years from now, people are going to look at us and say, what did we do when these children were being trafficked, when these women were being abused, when these cartels were killing our children, what did we do? And I'm, I'm glad to be um, a part of what you're doing. I would love to help in whatever way I can. And so the challenge for our listeners this week is to connect with what you're doing. And so where can we find you? Where where do we go if we want to support, as you've said, where do we do it? You can go straight to our website, uh, wffa.win, or you can search Women Fighting for America. You can text fight, text Fight, F I G H T, to 91776. But this is very important. I want you, and I'm wearing this t shirt, Women Fighting for America, that already. God has downloaded a plan for you, and it's called Battle Ready. If you go to our webpage, Women Fighting for America, there's a resource page to, a tab at the top. There's two things I want your listeners to do that are actionable. One, I want you to read and get a hold of the battle ready plan. We as Christians need to understand that we are commissioned by God to be warriors. We were born for this time, for this moment in history, and we don't understand how to put the full armor on anymore. And we have a helmet all the way down to the piece of shoes. And each one of those comes with an instruction and God downloaded that instruction to me, and I put it in a word format where you can actually read and have practicalness to become a warrior right now for the Lord to fight and battle for the heart and soul of our nation. The other resource is there's a take action plan. There's a 14 step plan to save America's future. In doing so, you're saving not only America's future, but America is the beacon of light and hope for the world. We are the watchmen for the world. When America falls, and all of you immigrants know this, who have come from especially countries who are under dictatorships, we are the last bastion of hope. And if we fall, 
the rest of the world will fall. And woe to us for not standing and being the watchman to make sure this does not happen. So get those two plans. And then the other thing I'm going to encourage you to do, please partner with Women Fighting for America. Sacrifice a dollar a day. I know the economy is really rough right now. But I promise you, when you give that dollar a day, God will take that dollar and he will 70 times seven that. You will be blessed beyond measure. You cannot and will not outgive God. And especially when that money is going to saving the least of these, and that is the children. That is God's commission to us. Do not harm or hurt my children. And Women Fighting for America is on the front lines protecting and defending and saving the lives of the innocent. Will you partner with us? You will be blessed by that dollar a day. And if you can do more, please do more. 100% of your money goes to the fight. Go text fight to 91776. Thank you so much, each and every one of you for your partnership. Thank you so much, Christy, for coming on the show today. We have learned a lot. My eyes have been opened. Um, I, I thought I was, you know, really connected to the news, but some of the things you've revealed kind of opened my eyes even further. And I'm glad that we're getting the word out. And I'm happy to be part of that network that gets the word out to as many people as possible. So I'm hoping that you're able to get all the support you need so that you can keep on the fight. And so thank you so much. And I thank your team for putting this together and giving you the chance to come and talk to us today. And we would love you to come back when the documentary is available, when are you expecting to release that? It will probably be released the end of April, beginning of um, uh, May. Okay. So we'd love to have you back when the documentary is available. And then we will we will promote that as well to uh, try to get more eyes to see what is happening because we can't, we can't turn a blind eye any longer. I think we are at a point where we need, you know, once you have 2 million people crossing these borders, where are they going? What are they doing? How are they being exploited? What is exactly happening under our noses? We need to know what is going on. And so thank you so much for your support and for coming on. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Alma. God bless you and God bless the United States. You're very welcome. All right. Thank you all for listening to our episode of Restitch America. And once again, we will put in this video all the details you need to support WFFA, Women Fighting for America, and also all the contact information on how to reach and interact with Christy and her team. So check it all out and we'll see you next week. 